you on Saturday, I was like, oh yeah, I was like, are my shoulders? I was like, <laughs> it was like, oh, it was one of those chairs like with a higher thing, and I was like, this, I was like, should I not be like this? And I was like, what do I do with my hands now? Do I touch? I'll touch. Okay. And I was like, this might look weird. And I'm like, what'd she say? Cool. <laughs> Dope. You guys ready? Yep. And action. Today, nope. And action. Hi, I'm Mike from Ride for Freedom, and this is interview number three with Catherine of HopeWorks. How are you, Catherine? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Mike? I'm great. I'm staying on your lawn right now, and you have a beautiful lawn. Well, <laughs> and a beautiful house and a beautiful family, so it's, awesome. well, it's been great being there. We're happy to be hosting you, and we're very thankful for the awareness um, and, uh, and the fundraising that you're doing um, to end human trafficking, so yeah. thank you for that. So your company that you are involved with is HopeWorks, so Correct. first tell us a little bit about you, and then tell us about HopeWorks. All right, yeah, so I'm Catherine. I'm a victim advocate and associate director from HopeWorks. Um, I use uh, she, her pronouns. I am a mom of twins, that 15-year-old twin, so that's always fun. <laughs> um, and for HopeWorks, so HopeWorks stands for uh, Healing, Outreach, Prevention, and Empowerment. And our organization, the mission is to end sexual violence. Uh, so we support victims um, and survivors of sexual violence, as well as with the intersections of human trafficking and domestic violence. Um, and we do also do a lot of education prevention, and so we go to the colleges and do some prevention trainings. We also work at the, with the correctional facility and do some trauma-informed trainings with our amazing sister organization, the Divas program there. Yeah. Which we also have an interview with, if you right. want to learn more about Divas. <laughs> yeah. um, let's talk. First, we talked about uh, HopeWorks has been around for a while. Correct. So let's talk about how it kind of got started. and what the evolution has been. Absolutely. So HopeWorks started back in 1973. So and wow. next year will be 50 years. And it started by women uh, just who noticed that there was just not support for people who've experienced sexual violence. Um, and it used to be called Women Against Rape. And the, they started a, a, a hotline where people were taking phone calls out of their house. And to this day, it's the same hotline number um, from back in 1973. Um, from there, it evolved into just, uh, you know, becoming where we are now in the hospital so we're at so when they, when someone shows up for a forensic exam uh, the hospital calls us and then we present our services and emotional support to survivors and sometimes they choose to have us or we answer questions and we'll spend that time with them at the hospital and then support them afterwards with whatever they need and they choose right and I assume it's every case is different absolutely every case is different because every person experiences trauma differently and their needs are different and their lived experience is different yeah Okay, and so that's how it started. How has it kind of grown in the, the 49 years, not 50 years? Well, right, so now I guess one of the ways that it's grown is, so initially when it started, I think it really only served women, and now they serve, we serve um, all identities and all genders. Oh, really? Um, usually we focus more on 15 year olds and, and, and over, um, but we will sometimes support parents if, if it's like, if, if there was children involved, sometimes the parents need that emotional crisis support or sometimes they get triggered, um, because they remember some of their past experiences. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so one of the ways it's grown is just that we serve all, um, which it didn't happen at first. I think it's it's a 24 seven hour outline now, and I think when it initially started, it wasn't. Um, and again, like it's just that we're in the hospitals, we're in the court, um, so that's another way it's grown. Just working with more organizations, getting into the school systems, those are just all like some ways that right. weren't there before and are there now. So it started out kind of hospital-based, and now it's branching out into other... I think it started off just like the phone call base. Oh, literally just Like just the, the, hotline. The, 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 the hotline, the emotional support on the hotline. That's that's kind of beautiful because it, it kind of starts with it just like this this kind of understanding of humanity and just right. needing someone to talk to. Absolutely. And then it kind of grew into something that could right. make, you're saying you're in the courts, maybe even legislative change as it grows. Absolutely, and stuff. yes. Catherine, can you discuss a little bit about how sexual violence presents itself in the state of Vermont? Well, it's pervasive. Um, you know, they say that like, you know, one out of four women report in one out of, th uh, sorry, one out of four women report and one out of five men report, but that's people that report. So it's actually even more pervasive than, you know, when we're sitting in a room, there's usually sexual violence, uh, victims of sexual violence in, mm. in the room. It's just, you may not know, they may not have disclosed yet. Yeah. Um, so we tend to, you know, obviously we work in the colleges where that's, um, you know, rape culture is, is, is rampant there. Yeah. Like a lot of victim blaming, uh, a lot of normalizing of sexual violence. So that's definitely a way it presents itself, but it's in every, 
um, you know, it's in families, it's in every work world, um, just there's a lot of, you know, sexual harassment, sexual assaults, um, you know, rape, incest, all of that is happening, every, like, it's just part of our culture. There's not one place now where I don't drive in shit and where I don't know of either a case of sexual violence or domestic violence that I haven't worked with someone in the area. Man. So that's, like, really, it's really hard to kind of, like, yeah. try to, to, di like, to disconnect when you're not working because it's like, oh, I, I, I know, like, because, you know, people have shared their stories and then you're right. like, oh, I, I know about that trauma or I know about that violent act that happened there. Yeah, and you were we were talking off camera, and you were saying like you had to stop watching documentaries. Correct. That were relevant to it. Right. So I used to be. Um, I'm fiercely passionate <laughs> about supporting victims of sexual violence and ending sexual violence, and so for a while, like I think I it almost became like an obsession where like that's all I ever wanted to watch or doing. But then I noticed that that kind of does you know take a toll on your mental health, and it's not. And, and I want to sustain in this field. Right. And so then I realized I need to set better boundaries for myself. Um, to be able to sustain that. Mm -hmm. And so one of the decisions I had told myself is that like, so if it's a documentary about sexual violence, domestic violence, or human trafficking, I'm only gonna do it during work hours okay. and to try to disconnect. So like, and, and you know, just to try to disconnect when I can. Um, so for example, when I'm home, uh, this counselor one time, she said one of the ways she, self care, cause you were talking earlier, you had been talking about self care, is that as soon as she gets home, she gets out of her work clothes and changes into something else. And just that mental, like just that, what that brain, like yeah. the messages that gives to your brain. So I even try to do things like that just to kind of, just to be able to kind of set that boundary and disconnect a little yeah. bit. Do you have any uh, tactics that you want to share with people? Of, of self-care? Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I, like, okay, so one of them is just sending, setting those boundaries of documentaries like or during work hours. Um, I definitely try to change, like, you know, even changing clothes, exercising. Um, I really notice if I'm like, if I am, because vicarious trauma is a real thing, and if I've yeah. noticed that either I've triggered or emotionally it's an intense, I try to go swimming or I try to go for a run, because um, I find those movements of like that bilateral movement really helpful, because it works out kind of that trauma within your body and the yeah. stress. Um, so those are some of the tidbits that I do. I try to get good night's sleeps. Um, and also just like, yeah, just giving yourself permission of like, I need to tap out right now. And so I have great, we have great advocates and we've told each other, like, if you need to tap out, it's okay to just say, I need to tap out. And we've, you know, we've, we've done that. There was at the end of sexual violence awareness month last year, I was on call that last week, but it was also take back the night and, and uh, I was supposed to finish the shift at five and I was just counting down the days mm. because it was just a lot. And at 4.30, a hospital call came in and I knew I didn't have it in me. And I called and I, I started crying to my, and she's like, I'm going, I'm going to the hospital. Like, and just cause she was in a better place. So we yeah. try to, to do that for each other. Um, and we kind of make that, that that's okay. That's yeah, okay that we need to tap out. It's okay that you need to self care. And as a mother of two twins, I mean, there's so much going on at home that yeah. it's, it takes a whole village, as I said. It does take a whole village, yes. And uh, what is this village? What is the size of Hope Works? Uh, we're, uh, we're small, like we're only about six people. So we have a counselor, um, and then we have uh, one, two, three, four, four full-time advocates, and then a few part-time advocates, and then a person that does our, like the financial stuff and the grants. Yeah. So let's talk about positive change that you've, personally experienced in your time. You have been with HopeWorks for, did you say? About four years. Four years, yeah. okay. Do you wanna, can you share a story without uh, breaking any anonymity? Or right, well I would say, I, I guess for me it comes down to like some of the stories that I love the most are when, I mean I've had a survivor say to me like, as much as I have supportive friends, you're the first one who really understands it or understands me. Like when someone says that and they've been able to find that connection in a, in a really like isolating, you know, sexual violence leaves you feeling very alone mm -hmm. because you were alone when that violence happened. Um, and so when someone says like, oh my goodness, you understand my trauma, you understand and you connect with me and you're the only person and you're able to be that person for them. Um, you know, cause once you find there's such, a, when you experience sexual violence, it means someone didn't see you in your humanity. Mm -hmm. And so for someone to then reconnect you to a, human, to, to a humanity piece, it just feels wonderful. Also, just knowing sometimes some people, you know, there there was some cases where we were able to help with some safety pieces and just help them steps of the way and knowing that they're now in a safe place. Um, 
you know, still struggling because they, you know, emotionally, psychologically, that takes a lot of work to heal, but just giving them that opportunity to find safe housing um, and then find counseling um, yeah. and just that kind of stuff is just beautiful. And yeah. Yeah. So for me, it's just being able to be present right. um, for other people and their trauma and not being so many. One thing I've learned is so many people are afraid of trauma and, and talking to people and so afraid, like they get their guard up, like, please don't talk to me about your trauma, please don't. It wears like, I'm like, no, I'm here and whatever you need to share. I'm here to hear it. Yeah, I, I studied uh, music therapy in, in oh. school, and a big thing in like the, the therapy world is just like uh, uh, imposter syndrome. You're like, yeah. oh my god, I can't like help these people and stuff like that. And I feel like the best experiences I've had in life are just like trying to be trying to be a human being, trying to be nice. And right. it kind of sounds like that's what hope, hope works. Is trying Absolutely, to do. the best advice I started off as a volunteer, and the best advice that the person trained like trained us said, let your humanity take over. Um, because initially I was actually really afraid of taking the hotline because I was really afraid of causing harm, right? Yeah. Like of saying, the, like, you know, this fears yeah. of like, what if I say the wrong thing? What if I don't, you know? And I remember I had talked to my counselor before with that and she's like, uh, she's like, you know, the trauma already happened. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, oh, right. Yeah. And then just you, and really that's all it is, right? Let your humanity take over. Right. You're there to listen with no judgment. You know, yeah. we all process trauma differently and there's no, like, uh, you, what I've learned is that, you know, there's no right reaction or right feeling to the way you experience trauma. Right. It's just, you know, it's okay. It's all normal reactions to abnormal events that have happened to you. Yeah. And yesterday we were talking in the car about this stuff and you said something that I really loved and you're like, I don't tell anybody what to do. Right. And I think that's great. And I think that's hard too, especially as a mother, yeah. uh, as someone that's been in this field for a while now, right. that's been with Hope Works for four years. It's about empowerment, right? Because right. sexual violence is, means someone took something from you and you didn't have that choice. So people need to have that choice again. And I also, it also comes down to actually safety planning. Um, I don't know, like in safety planning, we always think physical, but it's also emotional and psychological. Mm. So I don't know if they're ready to disclose yet. And that might be actually emotionally harmful for them at that moment if they're not ready to disclose, right? right? If they're not ready to be going to report it, I don't, I can't make that decision for anyone. It really needs to be what's right for them. Right. And that empowerment is like so important after you've experienced sexual violence. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I just have one more question. For yes. You, um, is there a way that people can help out or get involved? Absolutely. So they could go to our uh, the HopeWorks website. Um, so it's just www.hopeworksvt.org. Um, and so visit that. It was a great way. And also go visit Give Way to Freedom. Um, they, they work with um, victims of human trafficking. We work with all victims. Um, they focus on that. So I would just, those are a great way to help. Donations are always great. And we always could use hotline volunteers. Cool. Thank you so much. And... Tonight you're making a lasagna. And yeah, tonight, to I'm, try that. tonight I'm making you all lasagna. <laughs> cool. Thank, thank you. Thank you for listening to Ride for Freedom interview number three. Woohoo! Out. Okay. <laughs> Cut. Mm-hmm. All right. Lurcia, how would I do? I was nervous. You made me nervous. You made me. Lurcia, I don't know if you know that.